So this video is about um, the assigned readings of Plato's Apology and his Crito, two of Plato's dialogues. Um, so I'm going to be Socrates at this point. Um, all right, so my name is Socrates. I was just a stone cutter in Athens, although stone cutting did, uh, was respected a lot more than it might sound like because sculpture was uh, extremely valued in my society. And also, if you remember, the Temple of Athena was very carefully designed so that the columns were actually out of proportion, but um, they looked proportionate to human beings so that you would get that pleasure out of a sense of order, that the universe is ordered, the soul needs to be ordered, society needs to be ordered, all for the sake of flourishing. Um, this kind of order isn't superimposed, it's not repressive, it's natural, it's a natural product of evolution. Evolution occurs in, according to a certain order, and also it gets more and more complex. Like reality desires to become more and more complex, just like human beings should naturally desire just to explore, to use their minds, to engage in all sorts of activities. So being a stone cutter was really a part of cultural life, um, but I didn't have the status or the educational background. So even though we officially had a democracy and it was designed to get uh, a much larger number of people engaged in public life than any other society we ever knew, there still was definitely an elite class. Uh, and Plato, one of the young men that used to follow me around, was definitely a member of that class. Both his mother and his father were from respected old families, right? But so the story of my life is agonizing really, because all I thought was that I was trying to be a good citizen. And I was trying to do my duty, my responsibility to the, the city and to my fellow citizens. And I ended up getting killed for it. So I need to tell you my story about my way of life and then you have to decide, was I guilty? Should I have been killed for living this way? So what did I get accused of? I got accused of not believing in the city's gods, the traditional religion, and of corrupting the youth. So, um, so here's how I explain my, how I explained my life to the jury. And what the explanation shows is that Athens lost its democracy, spiritually lost its democracy way, way before it actually collapsed and they elected a dictator. There just were not very many people in Athens at all who were interested in thinking like a citizen. And our founders and the poets, everybody who had set up all of those institutions that I talked about in the last video, they all knew that life is complex and ambiguous. People are going to have different opinions. You must learn to listen to other people. If you have opinions, you have to give reasons. So other people might disagree with you but you can agree to disagree as long as a person is tying their faith and any sort of idea of good to a set of arguments. Because sometimes situations are so complex that there are really good arguments on both sides, but as things change, 
then perhaps one argument will look better than another. But if people are always seeking out what's true and what's best, they'll be able to preserve the democracy. Um, if they're very uh, critical of anybody who tries to use fear or tries to use fantasy to gain control over other people, uh, trying to claim to know what they don't know, like the will of the gods, or try to claim that they um, can save, they have the power to control more than they can control, or if they think uh, they have some fantasy about how rich they can get or um, how powerful they can be. Like, why would they want to be rich or powerful? Why don't they want to be an engaged citizen? Um, or people who appeal to fear and they're excessively afraid. And so they look to somebody who seems like they're in charge. Again, that's, you're gonna lose your democracy. Anybody who oversimplifies situations and thinks that there's a silver bullet answer, that's the death of democracy. So you could tell from the way I defended my way of life that there were very few citizens that really wanted to admit human vulnerability and um, the need to compromise and solve problems one by one. They're just not interested. So when I talk about how I went and questioned people, but at the very beginning of that, my defense, I said, you know, all of you out there, the jury, and this is true. Um, my worst accusers are the ones from starting 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that when I was actually doing what a citizen should do, all these false rumors were spread about me. People said all sorts of horrible things about me um, way before that, which means the majority of Athenians didn't want anybody doing what I was doing. So they weren't interested in democracy. So what did they think democracy was? Well, freedom to do whatever you want. That's not what it is. But anyway, so I knew when I stood in front of the jury that they had already made their decisions. They weren't going to listen to me. They had closed their minds, right? And they had oversimplified the situation and they had believed in people who used false rhetoric like Melitus and um, people who didn't conform. I wasn't a rebellious person. I was, you know, I was pretty humble. Like nobody, anyway, I got accused of being things that I was not. Um, so, so uh, yeah, they accused me of saying things like, he believes that the sun is really a stone. Well, what they're referring to is the pre-Socratic philosophers who were trying to find a natural foundation for reality because they wanted to use their minds and they thought that that's what the gods wanted. Um, the way the universe evolved was such that we had minds to understand, the universe was understandable. And so the, the speculative thinkers thought they were engaged in a very sacred activity of seeking out the underlying causes. So when people accuse me of thinking the sun is a stone, what they, what they are saying is that we want anti-scientific, anti-rational explanations for natural events. We want blind faith. So we're not going to try to fix any problems. We're just going to ignore 
any, any kind of prevention of problems. And when problems happen, we're just going to say it's God's will. That's not democracy. Democracy is about thinking the gods want you to use your mind, fix problems, set up a good society, self-correct, keep fixing it, keep tinkering with it, create a middle class. So just the very fact that they accused me of that and they thought that was partly why I should get killed. <laughs> what are you thinking, right? They, they had no idea what democracy was and what our founders had in mind. Um, you were unpatriotic if you didn't believe that the causes of things were like Zeus had a bad hair day that day, or he's, you know, Hera's taking revenge on Zeus, so she's gonna kill somebody just for fun. Like what? You can't have a democracy. Um, okay, then the other thing that the people thought I was a sophist, that I was, um, the, the sophists were the educators, right? Again, I talked about that in the previous video. And um, the sophists got paid a lot of money to teach the, the rich class um, how to be persuasive. So right away, when I started my defense, I said, people are telling you that be careful because I'm really good at rhetoric. I'm this big sophist. I'm not, right? And the fact that people couldn't tell the difference between me and a sophist, again, they don't know what democracy is um, because the sophists were foreigners and they were actually, actually moral relativists. They didn't believe there was good or evil. They just taught rhetoric, whatever. Here's a tool for people to get what they want. And they just assumed the Athenians had their own set of values. I'm just giving you the tools so you can actually achieve your goals. Well, that's a corrupting influence. Because in democracy, you have to assume there is a truth. There is a better and worse way to run a society. Human beings do have natural capacities. And the society is accountable to be structured to provide opportunities for them to develop those capacities. So I was not a sophist. I, did, I wasn't a relativist. I didn't teach rhetoric. I didn't use rhetoric. But it's just people could not get, they couldn't tell the difference, which means they're not interested in thinking like a citizen in a democratic society. They, not only do they, they not accept complexity and ambiguity, they thought it was cut and dried that I was a sophist, which is exactly wrong. Um, then when the Oracle at Delphi said, no one is wiser than Socrates. <laughs> First of all, I just, I was surprised, right? I'm a stone cutter. And all I'm doing is going down to the agora and holding people accountable. In a democracy, people with power have to be transparent. Somebody has to ask them what they're doing and they have to answer because if they can do whatever they want and never are transparent, that's not a democracy. And after they ask them, why are you doing it? Prove to me that what you're doing is going to promote human flourishing, that it's using your power for the well being of the citizens. So they have to be transparent and they have to be accountable. You don't have a democracy unless you have that. And that was all I did. And yet I was accused of being unpatriotic and sacrilegious and corrupting the youth. I didn't believe in the city's God. I mean, 
come on. <laughs> that was, oh my gosh, it was so upside down, right? Um, so the people also needed to know, people in positions of authority, especially political authority, they had to know if this person was competent. Do they know what they're doing? Um, and then are they using their power? Are, are they, do they have the knowledge base? And then the, do they know actually how to manage and how to implement their knowledge? Because you need to expose if the appointed positions, the positions appointed by the elected officials, if they're given that job because they're competent and they're just, or if they're given those jobs because they help, they belong to the political party and they pay money to promote their candidate, but they don't have any training <laughs> in what the job is about and they don't have any proof that they're good at managing people to, or, and using their power, hiring the people who will apply the rules for the benefit of the people. You have to know if they are what's called political hacks, right? Completely incompetent, but the rulers are helping their family and friends. <laughs> of course, there has to be transparency. Well, then I used to ask the poets, right? Poets are called poets. They should be called poets because they can educate us. And they use music and the arts to touch our hearts. So they want to educate us emotionally. They want to teach us how to feel. It's not giving a sermon or a lecture. It's a, an experience, an engagement, getting in touch with your emotions. So, of course, they need to be accountable because they can either, they have this power to trigger emotions. Okay. Show me that you're doing it in a way that educates people rather than manipulate, right? So the poets needed to be accountable. Otherwise, they might be in it to make money or to gain status or to gain some kind of power. And, they, and um, they're just tapping into irrational emotions and sort of legitimizing. Uh, people's irrational emotions, and they're even making it worse. So, of course, they need to be accountable. Um, because, again, citizens in a democracy need to be emotionally mature so that when they exercise power, they vote on these really important decisions. They don't react in an emotionally immature way. Then there are the manual artisans, just like the shoemakers, right? People that have a skill, but just because they're good at making shoes doesn't mean they're good at running a society. So, you know, I would ask them, what is justice? Um, how do you understand how to run the city? What do you think of this policy or that policy? What do you think of this leader or that leader, right? Because we're supposed to talk about this stuff. And then I found that they really were arrogant, right? They thought just because they voted for things that they didn't have to be informed, right? I can vote any way I want. Well, do you know anything about this person that, that you have to decide on? Oh. <laughs> do you know any of the big issues? Oh, you know, but I know enough to vote. I always vote, but, but if you don't engage, right? <laughs> if you're totally ignorant, why should you have the power to make decisions when you haven't gone down to the agora and got informed about what's going on at the assembly or what's going on in the jury, in the criminal trials and learning about what decisions were made. And I mean, if you're not doing any of that, should you vote? <laughs> well, of course, right? I'm a citizen. Um, 
Okay, so then the young people would watch this happen. And, you know, sophomore, the word sophomore in Greek means wise fool. <laughs> Why? Well, because sophomores often are really good at criticizing adults and seeing their hypocrisies and their weaknesses. But that's because they have not yet chosen something. And often when they decide, you know, to go with this profession, then all of a sudden, well, it's not that cut and dried. <laughs> like It never was. But anyway, so when they're in that kind of a mood, um, they come and follow me. And I did speak to them, right? I spoke to them saying, you know, you don't want to make those mistakes. You need to educate yourself. You need to become more mature. Don't just laugh at these people. Avoid making those mistakes. Um, and then Meletus, his argument against me was um, that, I, you know, Meletus was blind obedience to your country, your family, and your religion and um, loyalty, right? But if you, if you, live on the base of loyalty, then, then no one's accountable to the rule of law. You'll break the laws, you'll ignore the laws for the sake of your family or for the sake of your church or whatever. And then you don't have democracy. Um, so Meletus was not a Democrat, not interested in democracy. He was interested in the appearance of being virtuous, not the reality. Um, and then when people were saying to me, and I, I said that, you know, I said, people said to me, well, aren't you afraid you're going to get killed? <laughs> well, all I'm doing is being a good citizen in a society that I really like, and I want to preserve it. I don't care about, I don't worry about if I could get killed or not. What I decided is that it, if I stayed home and did nothing, that would be, a, I would be a coward, right? So I needed to have the courage of my convictions. If I believe I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, I have to do it. I can't be a weenie. I can't, um, cower in the face of the corruption that I see all around me. Um, so the other thing I noticed that I pointed out to the Athenians is that they spent, they waste so much time. They get dissipated energies. They get so preoccupied with all sorts of petty, stupid things. And they join these little clubs and they, they, you know, entertain themselves, they dissipate themselves, they get all hung up over stupid stuff. And the thing they ignore is the one thing that's so valuable, learning how, respecting your own humanity and your own dignity. The ability to think like a citizen is a higher order kind of thinking. The ability to have empathy with other people and so to just ignore that and get obsessed with things that are worthless, I just kept telling them, you know, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> um, I was like a father. Good fathers should tell their children those things. Um, and then toward the end, I pointed out that the jurors were mad at me because I didn't bring my family in because I had two little kids and a 13, a teen, you know, sort of adolescent and two little kids, even though I was pretty old. Um, but I told them, yeah, that's the way, that's what a rhetoric teacher would tell you to do. Just distract the jury, um, you know, punch the pity button, right? You should pity me, let me off, you know? And I just told them the truth. Like, you're not handing out candy. Like you don't have a right to manipulate the laws according to how you feel. The whole process of being a juror 
is that you assess the evidence. And so I'm telling you the truth about how I lived. And you are assessing the true story and deciding if this is what you want in your city. And then, of course, they voted against me, which just make it blatant. It was already obvious nobody cared about democracy. But then they voted, <laughs> okay. And then they voted to kill me. And so it was so blatant. I just told them, look, you're going to get a terrible reputation in the rest of the world because you pride yourself on your big democratic society. And then you go and kill the person who is the only real citizen in the whole society. And apart from whatever you think, everybody else in the world knows that. They know that my way of life is what you have to have in a democracy. And some of them say, yeah, and I don't want it, and I'm glad I don't live there. And other ones say, yeah, and I sure wish I could have it, and I can't believe the Athenians didn't want it, right? Whatever it is, they know, people in other societies know that the way I lived was the way you have to live. Um, so I, so the only thing I really worried about, which came out at the end, was um, that my children get raised to care about what matters. And I, I was gonna die and they were gonna be young. So that was the thing that bothered me. So I have one, last lecture to give you. Then I'm going to stop the video and in class we're going to talk about it and then we'll do, I'll start the video again about Crito. But here's my one takeaway. I have one extremely important piece of advice for you. Please try not to be guilty of pride. Try to avoid thinking you know more than you know about anything. Try not to stereotype people. Don't spread false rumors. Don't fear people who disagree with you. Try to stay curious and open. Always be ready to consider any issue from many angles before coming to a conclusion. Be willing to change your conclusion. Don't worry about how it makes you look to other people. That doesn't mean you shouldn't love your country and its laws and institutions. You have a democracy, the greatest political system. But in order to preserve a healthy democracy, you have to have carefully thought out way of life. Some people who defend traditions are really moral and some are corrupt. Some people who challenge the status quo are really moral and some are corrupt. We all get deceived and we all can deceive others, but don't tell yourself a lie about yourself because that's the ultimate deception. Don't lie to yourself. Um, yes, I had a different way of life but I cared about justice and virtue, and I did have the courage of my convictions. So was I a great asset for democracy or was I a threat? How would you vote? So I'm gonna shut this off and uh, we're gonna talk about it in class. But on the video, for right now, why don't you write your notes about what you wanna say in class? Okay, so this is um, a dialogue with Crito and Socrates. And Crito is going to explain to you why he did what he did, according, you know, what he did in the dialogue. He's going to tell you his story and how it got to that. And then Socrates is going to explain to you what he was thinking and why he responded that way. Okay? So, God dang it, you know, I love my city state as well as anybody else. I support my city state. I'm a good Athenian citizen. And I also love my friends, right? I 
I'm one of the people who has the power and the money to make good on that, right? I love my friends and I protect my friends. I'm a good friend. I'm a loyal friend. I love the gods just as much as my political enemies, just as much as any other Athenian. I'm loyal to the gods. But that period in Athenian history was so awful. I hate to think about it. it makes me so mad. <laughs> so here I am, you know, I'm Crito. I'm one of the aristocrats in Athens. I love my city state and I'm a liberal, right? Eh, I'm a total believer in democracy, not like those dang conservatives who just really, they're not Democrats. Blinds obedience to the, to the city's gods, blind patriotism, anti-science, uh, protect your, and anti-science, are you kidding? That's not democracy. So of course, our political party was right. We were the progressives, we were pro-science, we were the intellectuals. Um, but what happened was, right? We went and fought that war and we lost. And then uh, people started questioning. And then the Spartans came, you know, in, it was terrible. Oh my gosh, it was so humiliating. But then, of all things, the people vote for Critias, which, oh my gosh, they should have seen right through it. Right, for somebody to say, if you vote for me, I'll get us back to traditional Athenian values of blind patriotism, blind religion. Are you kidding? That's exactly what Athens wasn't. But they voted for him. So lo and behold, right? He starts killing off his political opponents and foreigners and everything. Well, what did you think he was going to do? You dodos? All right. So for nine months, we had this awful situation. Then we bring in the Democrats. Okay, so the Democrats come back. They get into power. Then they start, everybody starts using the courts to take revenge on their political enemies, right? They can't kill them, but they can take them to court and they can blame them. So, so then, um, the conservatives bring up, you know, bring Socrates to court. Socrates, are you kidding? Like he's the only honest person in the whole city. <laughs> Why do you blame him? Oh my gosh. So they used him as a scapegoat, right? And I mean, that was horrible. So here we are in the courtroom. And I'm just thinking, how did this ever happen? How did I lose control, right? Like I have power in this city, what happened? And so then, then I told Socrates, I'll get you the best lawyer in town, you know? I have money, I could do this. He wouldn't take a lawyer, right? He defended himself, are you kidding? Like you can't win if you defend yourself. Well, <laughs> The way he defended himself, like Socrates, what do you want? Are you committing suicide or something? He didn't flatter them. He didn't bring in his children. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't beg for his life. Not only that, and he, he didn't promise that I'll never do it again. You know, if you just don't kill me now, I'll, keep, I'll put up and shut up. He didn't say that. He said, no, I'll keep doing this. Socrates, you're not supposed to say that. And then he said, I'm not bringing in my children because it, because I don't want to appeal to irrational emotions. Socrates, you're not supposed to do that. That People just get mad at you, right? Because they're telling you, you're telling them that they're not being responsible citizens. Now, this is not an issue of whether it's true or not. This is, how do you save your life? Like, what are you doing? Throwing away your life? Ah, oh, so then, you know, he didn't get a lawyer. He defended himself. And then he said all this stuff that was just exactly not right. So, okay, he gets found guilty. 
he gets, you know, luck. He gets death. All right. So I'll do what I got to do, right? So I did what I wanted to do and also what everybody expected me to do because I'm Crito and I'm Socrates' good buddy, right? I'm, I was actually his patron. I spent my money. I helped with his family because he was so poor. So I sort of supported his family and everybody knew that. So everybody is expecting me to shell out and find a way to get Socrates to spring out of prison and head over somewhere because I have friends everywhere. So I did, fine, no problem. I arranged for him to, um, I bribed the jailer. I arranged for some friends to have a ship down at the port, the Piraeus, and they would take them to my friends in Thessaly and we would get his family and they would all go off on the ship and live happily ever after, okay? So uh, it was, everything was in place. And then um, there was a religious festival where a ship went off and there were no killings until the ship came back. Well, there were these rumors that the ship had come back. So that was the night that I needed to go bribe the jailer and get it done, right? And so when I went there, so Socrates knew he was gonna die the next day. And so I assumed he'd be awake. Well, he wasn't, he was sleeping. <laughs> he was sleeping really soundly. It's like, what? Socrates, are you kidding? Like, you're gonna die. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know you said you don't care about death, right, in the apology, but I mean, sorry, everybody's afraid of death. So, um, so anyway, I waited for you to wake up and I had planned all these reasons. I gave, I gave them seven reasons, right? Good reasons. They're all legit in my mind, right? First of all, I would lose a friend and I don't wanna lose my friends and I have the means not to lose my friends. And that's partly why you have money and power. So you can protect your own, your family and friends. Okay. Second reason was um, people would believe, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if, if Socrates had gotten killed, everybody would assume that I didn't want to shell out the money to save him, that that was the reason. <laughs> it's like, and um I want to be a hero, right? I want to be the hero. I'm going to save Socrates. And I'm, you know, I'm glad I have money. I'm not cheap. Um, and the third reason was um, Socrates, if I told Socrates, if you don't want to escape because you're worried that your friends are going to get a bad reputation because they'll be caught, you know, that they helped out, they were in on it. That's okay, because we're willing to make the sacrifice for you, because we really care about you, because that's what it means to be loyal, that you would even go to prison, get arrested for the sake of your friend. Um, then if you think, um, yeah, there's other places, like in terms of logistics, it's no problem. There's other places where you can go, and I've set it all up for my friends in Thessaly. And, and Socrates, if you stay there, um, it'll just, you'll play in the hands of the enemy, right? Because if you stay, you're agreeing that you are a criminal, right? And you're accepting the punishment and you're not. So you deserve to escape, so escape, right? It was, it's clear as day to me. Um, and then the last one, of course, you know, I, I told him, your children are going to grow up as orphans unless you escape, right? You got to be a good dad. And I, I have the tools to do that. I'm going to do that for you. And um, I mean, it was so annoying because I knew Socrates was, was a special guy, right? The conservatives hated him because he wasn't blind obedience. The liberals hated him because he was very self-controlled and he didn't screw up. And he also went to the temples 
and um, followed their religious rituals. Um, and he definitely had all the virtues that we associate with being pious or righteous. And some of those liberals were pretty um, in your face, anti-religion or promiscuous, self-indulgent, or they were relativists. And, you know, they didn't like Socrates because he was too traditional for them. And so I recognized that he was really better than any of those other people. And I wanted to be a hero. I didn't want him to die. Um, so I just, I just didn't think it was a problem, right? And I had all this good reason. And then he didn't go. Like, oh my God, it was the worst of the worst. And I hate to think about it. Um, anyway, so that's Crito. So all of you in the class, um, you can stop the video right now and write down if you agree with Crito or not. But I'm going to keep it, keep it going. And I'll be Socrates. What was Socrates thinking, right? Well, Socrates is going to say, you know what? When I found out that the ship was coming in the next day, I knew. I, <laughs> I knew that Crito would come there and try to get me to escape. Because I know about the Athenians and the way they think. And the, the thing that's really revealed by that event is that nobody in Athens had any respect for the rule of law. The rule of law is the cornerstone of a democracy. And so, again, we didn't have a democracy. It doesn't matter if you called yourself a conservative or a liberal or a dodo, or a dumby, or whatever. I mean, if you don't respect the rule of law, you are not a citizen in a society that's governed by laws. And so I knew Crady was going to come, and I knew everybody expected him to do it. I mean, everything he said, I knew he was going to say. <laughs> okay, so he starts out saying, you're my friend. And so, you know, for him, justice is helping your friends and harming your enemies, which is exactly what Meletus was doing. Um, that's not, is that, I don't think that's friendship, right? Friendship isn't blind loyalty. And it definitely isn't a reason that you could break whatever law you want, okay? Um, people wouldn't believe, right? So the very fact that, that I knew and Crito knew that if he had, didn't come, everyone would have thought he was too cheap, which just shows you that nobody had any respect for the rule of law. Then when he said, Our, your friends are willing to take the hit for you because we're heroes. And I was like, that's not being a hero, right? So just being loyal to the end is not, heroism. You know, if they were really heroes, they would abide by the rule of law. They would be upright citizens. They would live the way that I lived, right? And they wouldn't let political animosity drive them. Um, so I knew that a lot of people who liked me also had very different motives than I did, very different characters very different reasons for being progressive or liberal. Um, but there wasn't anything I could do about it, except I could tell Crito, no, I don't think that's heroism. Um, the other thing is that Crito was obsessed about his public image, right? People will say, but everybody with money and power is obsessed about their image because that's how they got the money and the power in the first place. But it's not important, right? People shouldn't worry about that. They should worry about truth and justice. Um, and then the idea that there are other places he could go. Um, that, that's something that it's really important to realize, right? Even you, 
in the USA today, if your country falls apart and somebody accuses you of something, maybe unjustly, and you have to go to court and it turns out the accuser has a really expensive lawyer and it really looks like you're gonna get accused of something you didn't do. Well, <laughs> are you gonna escape? Um, are you gonna have friends that will help you escape? Well, that means nobody cares about the rule of law, right? It's not the system that was the problem. It's the, it's the corruption of the people running the system. And money is corrupting the court system, which it was in Athens also. Um, but, um, Oh yeah, the other point is that there isn't anywhere for you to go, especially if you have children. You must think about this. If you go to a European country, you'll get caught. If you go to a country where you would want your children to get involved, it's a free and open society, they could get citizenship, they could become engaged citizens. Any country like that isn't gonna keep you they're gonna send you back. The only place you can go is to some remote place, Papua New Guinea maybe, <laughs> some place where they wouldn't care. They wouldn't know that you were a fugitive or they wouldn't care. But then they would tell your children, oh yeah, your dad's a lawbreaker and that's why you're here. And the children would have no opportunities they would have really crippled lives, right? Whereas if you stay in America, they can. So it's just a better life for your children. If you get falsely accused, just to stay. Um, and that was true then, and it's true now. So, and people like Crito, they really don't believe it. They really don't get it. But if you understand that, then you should really worry about your country and make it a good place because anybody can be unjustly accused at any point. And if the system is corrupt enough, you're gonna lose. So I do think you should realize you have skin in the game, like it matters, not just in principle, but in fact. Um, I can't believe how indifferent people are, how many of my students at Lyons say, well, I don't think about, how can you possibly not think about it? <laughs> like so much of your life is affected by it. I, I, it just boggles my mind. But as I said, my dad marched in someone when I was 10 years old, eight years old. I mean, it just, there was no such thing as not thinking about these things. Um, so then, after Crito, you know, gave all of his reasons, and I argued against them, right? Um, so what I said, ultimately, I was worried about my children, right? But what, just like Euthyphro, remember I said he thought he was part of the solution to set up himself as the, somebody who really cares about the gods? And he was really part of the problem because he was undermining people's assumptions about the gods, respect for your parents. Um, just like that, Crito thought he was part of the solution when he was really part of the problem, which was lack of respect for the legal system and then the ability to ignore the laws or to pay an expensive lawyer to get out of stuff. So he wasn't the savior, right? So, um, so then in the last part of the dialogue, I pretend I am the laws and the laws are talking to me and saying, look, we gave you stability. We gave you, you know, we protected your children, provided education. Yeah, and the whole point is that we are creatures of culture. We depend on laws and institutions. We can't live without them. So government, political society is a very, very integral part 
of our survival and then especially of our, our uh, flourishing. So yeah, I didn't leave Athens. I liked Athens, where else should I go? Athens provided me all these opportunities for being engaged in public life. Why would I wanna go anywhere else? Um, so if you want people to have the leisure time and the opportunity to engage in public life, artistic, scientific education, all that really high quality stuff, you, have, you are even more dependent on laws and institutions because you have to have educational institutions and um, institutions of artistic creativity, science. I mean, all those things make societies more complex more laws, more institutions, but also they give people more opportunity to develop themselves. So the last part of that dialogue is just pointing out that, you know, you, you shouldn't undermine the laws. And Athens, the problem with Athens wasn't the way it was set up. It was the corruption of the people who were applying the laws, voting for things. It was the people that was the problem. In, in other societies, it's the, the system that's the problem, but any place that would, where the system would be a problem, you wouldn't be able to read Plato's dialogues. So that's not relevant. Plato is read in societies where it isn't the system that's the problem, it's the people. So my final um, statement here for this dialogue is, what I said to Crito, and what I say to you, and what I say to anybody who bothers to listen, right? A good person does not worry about what they think, whoever they is. A good person only asks, what is the right thing to do? And is guided by reason or the mind, noose. By the, this is the capacity we have to seek good and evil and to get to better and worse understandings of it. A good person will never allow reason or mind, our ability to understand these things and to act on the basis of what we understand. A good person will never allow that capacity to be corrupted by pressure from other people even if they threaten to kill you, right? You're not gonna let your mind be polluted. Not mere life, but the good life. An examined life is the life worth living. A good person never does wrong intentionally. Uh, they might think or act, think they're acting well, and then they decide later that they made a mistake. But a good person will never act deliberately against what they believe is wrong. A good person will never injure anyone, even if it's retaliating, retaliating, right? Even if they get injured, they will not fight back because it just creates chaos and you destroy a free and open society. A good person recognizes that human beings need a system of law and order to survive. The more developed or civilized a society is, the more it needs social institutions and laws. In a democratic society, people are free to leave. You don't have to stay. It's just that people in their right mind would know that they've got something pretty good here and they wouldn't really you know, be that interested necessarily in leaving, but they can always choose to leave. But if they choose to stay, they have to accept the decisions of the courts. They can't just all of a sudden run away and then, you know, undermine the system. That's not playing fair, right? If you live there, you have to accept it. Now, out of all of Crito's arguments. Um, the one that I felt the worst about was the one about my children. Okay, I wanted to raise them and I wanted to raise them to have good values. 
but I had to ask Crito and my friends to raise them for me. And at the end of the apology, I did say that. Please teach them to care about virtue and justice and criticize them if all they care about is money and power. Because there wasn't anywhere I could take the children. And also, it really mattered to me that I didn't know what Crito was going to tell my kids right? What if he tells them, yeah, your dad was irresponsible, now you're an orphan, and then my children would be mad at me for eternity, right? Or if he's going to tell them, yeah, your dad had the courage of his convictions, and he was trying to avoid corruption in Athens, and the Athenians didn't pay any attention, and the city fell, and then when it starts recovering, it blamed him for the fall when he was the one that was really trying to prevent it. So if Crito would just tell my children that, right, then, you know, I'll be happy. I just don't know, right? I have to trust my friends. But the problem is every time you have a child, you're always, parents are always having to decide how much should I publicly criticize corruption? And then my children, you know, people say nasty things about me and they, my children get maybe demoted or gossiped about or, you know, socially uh, marginalized. So your children, you know, suffer if you speak out. But the trouble is if you don't speak out, then your society goes to pot. So... Parents always have to make decisions, how much to speak out and how much to put up and shut up so the kids can have stability. It's, there's never one answer to that question and it's always an issue. So then, uh, so now you're gonna have class and I can find out what you think about Socrates' way of life and about Crito and Socrates. Should he have escaped or not? What would you do if you were unjustly accused and why?